Good morning, everybody. Oh, no energy. Come on. This is digital. I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, so uh, that may wake things up a little. So what I'm going to talk about is the car industry. But first of all, who can tell me what that is? Anybody know? It's, there are some clues. Gentlemen over here, you're absolutely right. It's exactly where we are. So those coordinates are this conference in Munich. And they would be the, the coordinates today, tomorrow, and the day after, because those coordinates are fixed. Now, what you might think is, why have I started with that? Well, back in the day, if I can flick this on, back in the day, time was used to navigate. Now, here's a history lesson here. Anybody know what this slide is about? It's a bad longitude. Good. But there are some people paying attention here. Good show. What was very easy 300 years ago was you could work out latitude. What you couldn't do was work out longitude. A chap by the name of Harrison, who was a carpenter, invented the first sea clock. This was accurate to three seconds on a trip from the United Kingdom to the West Indies and back. No other clock had ever done that. The most important thing was he then could change the time or test the time from when he left to where he was, and one hour was 15 degrees of longitude. So he knew exactly where he was. The story goes that the British Navy was as successful as it was because they knew where they were. No other Navy in the world knew where they were. Mr. Harrison changed history. And of course, time played its part. But today, we still have traffic and we still have wasted time. Now, you could go to any urban environment in the world and you would see traffic like this. And the statistic there says we all waste around five days every year in traffic. And what this conference is about is, of course, making more efficiency, giving people the luxury of time. And what we see in the auto industry is many elements now are focusing on that particular issue. We are definitely in a new era. And that digital era probably started around six, seven years ago. Up until then, you saw the advent of technology. If you went way back, you saw product was the only focus. But technology started to come in the 80s, whether it was focused on safety, whether it was focused on navigation, for example. But now we're utilizing data. And we're utilizing data on a huge scale in the car. So all of the things that you take for granted that give you that experience in the car. But of course, now, data in forms of connectivity. And we are in the digital era. And what this means is that the car industry is just over 110 years or so old. But the business model of the car industry has not really changed for the last 100 years or so. People bought cars. People had used cars. We manufactured them. Ultimately, they were scrapped. And in between, people used them. Now that model is changing. And that's changing in every element of what we do as an industry. So it is definitely about evolution, and it is definitely about revolution. And as a car company, of course, we still have a lot of products which are going to continue to be adapted from the evolutionary state. The con internal combustion engine still has a long way to go in our view. The electric mobility is just starting. And electromobility is something we find very exciting. And if we look at the framework of legislation around the world, despite today's gas price, CO2 will continue to come down, miles per gallon will continue to go up, and probably horsepower will also improve in the same vein. So we have to push the envelope in both directions. And of course, those trends are affecting every industry, but I think very specifically ours. And first of all, it is about time in every aspect that we show. So urbanization, if I look and what customers see here, of course, we went from ownership to leasing. And today, 
flexible access. The cities around every part of the world are congested. It's not going to get any better. If I went to Tokyo, one of the oldest mega cities on Earth, 80% of the under 25 year olds that could have a driving license don't. Why? Because to own a car, you need a parking permit. And guess what? All the parking permits are gone. So unless you inherit one from your granddad, no way. And now we're into flexible usage. In Munich here, there are several hundred cars that you can lease by the minute. And no ownership, no insurance, no fueling, no parking problems, nothing to worry about. I get in it, individual mobility, and 20 minutes later or 25 minutes later, I leave it. And that is what we see in eight cities with today 400,000 active users. Average time in the car, about 25 minutes. And it's already past the break even. It's making a difference. 30% of the traffic in most cities is people looking for a parking place. 30%. So if you can eliminate that time that's wasted, then of course you get one of the solutions to urbanization. And similarly, just a few years ago, we started to invest in smaller companies. There's some bigger ones who are up there now, like My City Way, like Park Now, where these are aids to mobility, all designed to find the most efficient way to travel. And it doesn't only mean the car. It can be multimodal. You can, of course, purchase tickets for train times and so on and so forth. These apps are now available and are in very wider use. Tens of millions of people using them every single day. The environment. One year on from the launch of I, I3 and the I8, a new form of mobility focused in two respects, on a sports car, which is a plug-in hybrid, and the I3, which of course is a mega city vehicle. I'm delighted to say the i8, as a plug-in sports car, it has all of the credentials of a sports car that you would want. High performance, fantastic looks, I am biased, but at the same time, it has a CO2 footprint which most small cars would only aspire to. And again, when I see magazines like Top Gear, and this is a magazine for petrol heads, they gave it car of the year last year because it has changed mobility. This is a car that has rewritten the rule book. This is a car that we will bring technology from into the wider range of products over the months ahead. But it wasn't just a car. It was about the whole process, the way we make it in carbon fiber, using sustainable resources in Moses Lake in the United States, fiber which is then shipped to Germany, the factory uses wind farms. The materials used are recyclable. We use plastic bottles. We use uh, dye from olive trees, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And ultimately, many of the customers are going to use it by the minute rather than the complete ownership cycle. So one of the issues, and here we are in Munich, which is a relatively small city, but infrastructure for electromobility is a challenge, no doubt about it. And so a little while back, we thought, how can we help here? Because many cities are struggling with this. And so we've come up with a lamppost. This is a car company. It's a long, tall black thing with a light on the top. It's quite innovative. In essence, it's a multi-purpose piece of kit. It costs roughly the same as an ordinary lamppost, but it uses LED lights, which can vary depending on how much light is in the street. And it saves around 70% of the electricity of a conventional lamp. And with a plug on the bottom, you can turn it into a charging station. And for every kilometer of these lights, you could have 80,000 kilometers of free driving, and the electric bill wouldn't go up. A smart solution to a city situation, which we think will aid urban mobility and, at the same time, give us more zero emissions. Solar carports, induction charging, 
the cables are all beginning to disappear from this arena as well. And so many of the aspects of a car company you wouldn't expect, we are now heavily involved in as well. So on to customers. Next question of the day, who knows what that scene is? It's the election of the Pope in 2005. Obviously looking towards the Vatican, the crowds were waiting for the result. There's the same scene in 2013. A bit different. Yeah? Something has appeared in the picture. And we all know what it is, it's the device. So in a very short period, it's changed all of our lives. And all of our lives, of course, are being touched by it, and much of this conference is exactly about that. But we still have a network of dealers around the world. But guess what? 10 years ago, four visits for a customer before they bought a car. 2013, just once. If I ask any dealer in the world what that means, he says showroom traffic is down. What it also means, because in the same vein, we have many other elements here which come to pass. Internet research is now making up most of the knowledge that a customer has. I recently talked to a dealer in the UK who said he can't remember the last time a customer came through the door and didn't know what he wanted, and didn't know what he wanted exactly, because all that research has been done. Which means from our dealership point of view, their business model has completely changed in just a few years. And what customers are doing is the final transaction in a physical environment. And by the way, I still think that's important. We are selling an emotional product, and that requires that interaction with the product in a driving environment. But what it also means is that we need to enhance that physical environment. Because now, the customer's coming once. You get one shot at this. And if it's not right, you've lost it. So we're building brand stores in many of the big cities around the world, Rome, London, Brussels, and driver experience centers as well, where you can actually, in the big urban environments, and what you see there is one in Seoul that we opened last year. We're opening another one on the west coast of the States uh, right now. We have one on the east coast of the States, and so on and so forth, where people go to experience sheer driving pleasure, the core of the brand, a very different physical experience to what has been there before. And what that also means is that the selling process is very different too. And we looked around a few years ago as to what was going to be part of our future retail. And the product genius was one thing that came to mind. And they are not salesmen. These are people who will give you all the time that you want to explain the product. And when you are fully au fait with what the detail is, then the sales can take place. And that has to be efficient and streamlined as well. So a very different environment to what we've had in the past, and a very different business model, and a very different organizational structure in a new dealer environment. So connectivity, the car in the safety world, very connected now. Touching other cars around it, real-time traffic information by connecting to every other BMW on the road. It gives you real data. But of course, all of the safety aspects using the steps now, and I use that word deliberately, towards full autonomous driving. We have the first steps, but not the full steps. And I think that's still a few years away. But highly automated driving, traffic jam assist in our language, is more relaxed driving. Because you're in a traffic jam, by the way, it's not much fun. Then you do press the button, and up to a certain speed, the car will automatically go with the car in front of it. You don't need to do anything. Occasionally, you need to touch the wheel, but touch. So the car will, in essence, be towed. What you also see is many, many apps now being downloaded into the car. But we are very conscious that this also has to be at the choice of the customer. Because there are plenty of people out there, and I'm sure many in this conference, who would like the data that's in the car. And we are very clear in our mind that that data is specific to the customer, will not be used, 
unless the customer wishes it to be used. So connectivity, but to the customer's choice. Similarly, lots of different information sources that are also there. So if you want your emails in the car, fine. You can take that choice, you get them, and they can be read out to you. It makes a safer environment, utilizing many of the elements that you have. If you want to go into a car park, and we showed this in CES last week, we now have a car that will go into the car park and park itself, or into your garage at home, up to certain speeds. And that, as a technology, will come in cars in the not too distant future, in the short term. But again, that gives you more time. Why would you want to race around looking for a parking space if you didn't have to? And of course, the other side of that is the car can also come back to you using a smart device, it will find you. And we showed that in CES as well. But probably, because of legislation, that's a little bit further behind. So, ladies and gentlemen, lots of exciting times. This industry is coming up, as I said, for its century and above. And probably, the next five, maybe 10 years, we'll see more changes than we've seen in the last 100. And with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> Ian, the technology to do all sorts of magical things like drive the car autonomously mm -hmm. is already there. It's being tested, mm -hmm. Google most famously. How much of a gap is there between what the technology allows and what the humans, both customers but also regulators, mm -hmm. will be happy with? I think you raise a, a good question. I think. First of all, the regulation is evolving now. So you know, we will have the first steps in that regard. You know, without a driver, you will be able to move a car into a garage, but at slow speeds and, in, in essence, a controlled environment. We have traffic jam assist on an autobahn or a motorway or a highway, but not on a main road where you can get lots of things crossing and so on and so forth. And part of the thing, I think, for me is that as society, whilst the algorithms of all of this safety, using all of the lasers, using the uh, various sensors and cameras are there, are we ready for a decision that the algorithm would make? So if you are heading towards an accident for whatever reason, does the algorithm have the ability to make a decision for you that could either involve you know, a truck or a pedestrian? I'm not sure we're ready for that. And I think those type of questions are the things that need to be answered before we take the big steps into fully autonomous driving. The technology will continue to evolve, but I think there are some important other questions as well. So realistically, how many years before you think BMW sells a completely autonomous car? I think you're into you know, somewhere between seven and 10 years, but that depends on whether we're ready as society again. I think the technology will be more than capable in the next, in that period. But there are some other questions. And legislative-wise, again, that will take time country by country. And some countries are a lot more focused on this than others, for obvious reasons. So BMW is transitioning from a company that sells cars to a company that enables mobility, which includes selling cars but offering access to cars. Mm -hmm. The next generation is less keen to own a car, to insure a car. Mm -hmm. How is that going to pan out in terms of your business and also in terms of the insurance industry? Well, I think you know, there's a lot of questions in there. And you know, one thing we looked at a few years ago was you know, we could see these changes occurring. And you know, if you look at the megacity developments, you know, there are what, one megacity in Europe, which is London. Um, Istanbul on the outskirts of Europe is another, two in America, yeah? Tokyo in Japan, and the rest are in the emerging world. It's very clear that the congestion in those cities will limit the use of cars. Now, you can either see that as a threat to the industry, or you can see it as a motivation to change the business model. And that was one of the reasons we came up with a car sharing program. That's one of the reasons that you know, we took away a lot of the challenges for people to use a premium car in an urban environment. And 400,000 people would say, that's a good idea. 
And if I look at cities like Berlin, uh, if I look at cities like London where we've just rolled out, people are really excited to use it and at the same time have no desire to buy a car. Now, maybe some of them at a different point in their life would, but maybe some of them will never. And so you now see a different business model for a car company which is offering mobility on a shared basis. And honestly, you know, many, many people buy a product, they drive it to work, they leave it all day, and they drive it home in the evening. That suits some people, and it will suit, I think, a lot of people for the foreseeable future. But I think we also have to have different models alongside it. So if the car is increasingly your mobile connected device, mm. how worried are you about cyber hackers taking control of this mobile device? Again, um, you know, very good question. And one thing we're very clear on is that there are car systems and there are then the, the apps and so on and so forth, the connectivity on top. And the car systems have to have a very, very clear and strong firewall because the car systems are, of course, responsible for your safety, they're responsible for um, the security of the car and so on and so forth. And we do not want things coming across that um, because of what you just raised. You know, it is possible for us to slow down a car from a remote situation. It is possible for us to unlock your car if you lose your key, all on the connected drive system. But it's possible for us to do it. And therefore, keeping that firewall between this, the running of the car and what the consumer wants or the customer wants in connectivity is a very clear position for us. But if you can access the system, then the bad guy can access the system as well. That's always a risk, but you know, we have to be one step ahead as well. So you know, we're always updating these systems for that very reason. Let's talk about how you transition a huge company. BMW's got more than 100,000 employees, mm -hmm. and you're really rethinking what kind of company it is and how people work. So what are the hardest things in making this digital transformation inside the company, telling people maybe our priorities have changed? You know, I think, I mean, we've been doing this over uh, you know, quite a few years now. So you know, this, this change has been occurring in the way in which we construct our cars, the way in which we design our cars, um, and as I've mentioned a few things, in the way in which we sell our cars. But I think we're also conscious of the need to speed up. So, you know, we have made a lot of investments recently in a lot of the connectivity elements, um, which probably means that there are some things now which are not so important anymore. So, you know, if I looked in the past, we were uh, developing a lot of mechanical things. <coughs> That's disappearing because, by the way, <coughs> excuse me, the software is overtaking a lot of that. So, in essence, we're on that journey, but we need to keep nurturing it as well. So, we need to keep you know, expanding our knowledge and, of course, be very conscious of what our consumers want. You, know, you can look at the smartphone and you can say, that's a personal choice from each consumer. Or you can say, how does that smartphone enhance, and I use the, you know, the thing about time, how can we enhance the time that a customer has to experience the car when they want it, and then to experience mobility when maybe it's, uh, it's not so much fun anymore? And you're not meeting resistance from the dealerships? I think when I talk to dealerships around the world, they see the same trends. I mean, you can look at any high street in any part of the world or any shopping mall in America, and there are shops which are closed. That tells you something. Now, you know, if I look at our dealerships, the way we've opened a lot of brand stores now in the downtown areas where people are shopping, rather than in the outskirts of the city where people might come to sometime, we see a big difference. We have a lot of pop-up stores that may only be in a shopping environment for three or four or five weeks, or maybe even three days, and customers are able to meet. We have the BMW Welt here in, uh, in Munich, which, by the way, is the largest tourist attraction in the city, in fact, in Bavaria, you know, with around three million people who come a year because they're experiencing something. If I look at the Seoul Driving Center, it's impossible to do a test drive at a dealership in Seoul and really have fun. So we built a driving center out of the airport where people can experience what a true BMW is about, and they can have fun. So you showed some pretty cool new toys, the urban lamppost, some of the new <laughs> apps. You have a big R&D team. Yeah. 
Now, give us an idea of some of the things that they're working on now that hasn't been ready for showtime. <laughs> well, we've got about 10,000 engineers. Now, you know, we are developing products on a short, medium, and long term. Now, you know, there are many, many uh, technologies coming now in the powertrain area. So the internal combustion engine, which, as I said, still has a long way to go. But you know, we're researching hydrogen fuel cells. The problem there, or the challenge there, is the logistics of supplying hydrogen, not the technology of developing a car. We are looking at different ways of manufacturing. So you know, how do we give the customer the ability to bespoke their car at the last point in the process? You know, and you can see some of the technologies that are being talked about here that are more than capable of doing that. And these are all about speed of time to market, as well as, of course, being alongside this digital environment which is moving so fast. Let's talk about some of the tech that a lot of people here are starting to get excited about and how you're thinking about it. So wearables, you showed an mm. example of a watch. How yeah. do you see a future smart device that we wear connecting with the car? I think the connectivity you know, comes in various waves here. I, I mentioned that we'll do self-parking, and uh, you can do uh, call parking as well. But I say I think that's a bit further so will out. Will I call my car to come yep. and pick me up? It could be outside when you come. And that's more than possible. I think you know, there are some easier things that are available now. So you know, quick click on your watch or your device. When you come out, there's no ice on your car makes it easy for you to get in your car and drive away. No hassle anymore. And these are connectivities which have, I think, real strong value, particularly in an environment where it's cold. Yeah. What's virtual reality going to mean for the motor industry? Will we be wearing augmented reality headsets? Well, you know, we've taken steps which I think give uh, the customer a new experience. So head-up displays. You know, we brought in, uh, what, seven, eight years ago now. And on all of the large cars now, uh, it's almost standard. On all the small cars, it's an option. Now, what you have here is, I think, a, an element of virtual reality. But we're also very, very conscious of safety. And, you know, to use an American phrase, distracted driving. And therefore, what we have in the head-up display is information which you really need, not all the information that would be possible. And I think we also have to keep asking this question. You know, what is it that we want the customer to have, but also conscious of the safety of a you know, product which is traveling at 200, 250 kilometers an hour at some time in, in its uh, day or month or whatever? When are we going to get a battery that allows a car to travel a seriously long distance on a charge? I think we're already seeing some of that. And you know, I think industry, the, the battery industry, was at the start of the car industry. So the first cars were electric. Yeah? But the battery didn't really cut it, and the combustion engine took over. And now we see the battery starting to come back, being driven by this zero emissions uh, uh, target. But honestly, the battery hadn't developed much in that period. So now, I think we're seeing a lot of the intellectual horsepower around the world seeing how we move batteries from where we are today to where we could be in three or four or five years' time. If I look at lithium-ion, you know, lithium-ion is probably going to develop another 50 or 60 percent. So you know, another 50 or 60 percent range, for example, in the, the relatively short time. If you looked at lithium-air, then lithium-air has maybe four or five times what lithium-ion has. And if you look at solid-state batteries, then you're in a completely different ballpark altogether. But I think we also have to be conscious of the law of physics here. You know, when you compress more energy into a small space faster, then one thing happens. It becomes volatile. And that is maybe the thing where I think a lot of the technology and the, the smart investment needs to be. How do you control this environment? But to answer the question, we're going to see some big steps in the relatively short period now. Last question. Um, innovation often comes from the edges. Mm -hmm. There's a company in Bratislava in Slovakia called Aeromobil that's just launched a car that turns into a plane. You press a button and wings come up. How long until BMW is selling the flying car? Well, interestingly, you know, we started making motorcycles and then we started making plane engines. So we've got a bit of history in this regard. Um, however, I think it is probably a long time before we get true 
uh, intermodal vehicles of that type. He had the chance to launch it, didn't he? <laughs> Ian Robertson of BMW, thank you very much. Good to see you.